I grew up in a rural situation. We lived uh, just inside the, the town limits, small town, about eight, 9,000, in the mountains of uh, northeastern West Virginia. I knew I was different at a very early age. I knew intuitively that being attracted to my own sex was not acceptable. I don't know how I knew that. It's instinct. I knew enough to cover my tracks, to, to act out being something that I wasn't. I was about a junior in high school and we had a wonderful band professor um, and his wife, Virginia, was the local librarian. And one day I was at the library and Virginia beckoned me back into the stacks and she said, there's a book that Prof and I think you should read. And she handed me the book, The Well of Loneliness, which was the only fictional book, lesbian, out at the time. I read it and they never said, queer. They never said, you are different. They just said, you're going to go to university and when you're there, you're going to find a lot of other people just like you. And they probably saved my life because I, I covered up the depression, the fear I had. Um, I look back and laugh and tell my classmates, who now are very supportive, that I always had a picture of Betty Grable inside my high school locker. Everybody would see it. What they didn't know was on the other side was a wonderful picture of Tyrone Power. But it was difficult. There were no role models. There were, there were maybe two men around town that my father said, don't ever get in their car if they offer you a ride. And uh, of course, I was dying to get in their car. I didn't come out till I was a junior in college, and I just had, had enough being closeted. I mean, I didn't, didn't take an announcement. I didn't tell my fraternity brothers, but I, I was out to, to other gay people. And I came out to my advisor. Uh, I was an English history major and had planned on going to law school. I was going to become a state legislature and then run for governor, and I was going to be president. And uh, at my spring interview, Dr. Smith said, do you know what happened in Wheeling, February? And I said, yes, Joe McCarthy gave the speech about the communists and the government. And following that, the, uh, an undersecretary of state said there were 40 men fired from the State Department for being homosexual. And Dr. Smith said, you realize you have to change the plans for your life. You will never work for the federal government. So I didn't plan to go on to law school like my father and my mother had expected me to. I lied uh, to join the military. I volunteered because uh, my father was furious with me. He refused to go to the breakfast the American Legion held for inductees. My mother went, and we were got. A, I got on the bus to go to Clarksburg for the induction center, and I was very upset because my father had thought had abandoned me. And the bus pulled out and towards the sea, the highway. There was my dad standing at. Second Street and Davis Avenue. He had lost his arm as a child, and he, he was standing there very, very military, and he saluted the bus with the left hand, and I saluted him back. And so I, I lied and went. I woke up in the barracks with extreme pain in my stomach. I went on a sick call. The doctor examined me, and he said, uh, you, you go to the psychiatrist's office. And I thought, oh my God. It took me about three sessions to finally break down and cry and say, I am, I'm a homosexual. And the doctor, the captain, he said, that's the reason you have a pain. It's psychosomatic. So you're seeing all these naked men run around and it's affecting you. It's, it's part of who you are. Keep seeing me. And I kept on training. And then I got a sudden phone call and my father was very ill in the hospital and I, they put me on a, an army transport plane that afternoon and I got to the hospital and stepped across the threshold and fainted because he was dying of cancer. And he died at 8.17 that morning. And I, I had to go back to basic training, finished and got a week's leave. I went shipped off to Korea. And we never heard the North Koreans or the Chinese, but you could smell them because they ate this diet of garlic rice. And the other guy and I picked up, I never knew his name, picked up common wire, dropped machine gun, a bandolier, 
down to the MO and started back up the ridge line and suddenly you could smell them. We knew we were being infiltrated. And we, we ran, got to the sandbag, our trench line, and the other guy dropped his stuff and clambered up over. And I, I kept everything hung on me. I had my rifle, the Kamala around my neck, and the machine gun and with a sling over my other shoulder and I made it up over the sandbags and rolled over the top and collapsed down into the trench and I realized that it was like I felt there was a hand under my butt pushing me up and over and I still think that my dad hung around a while to look after me and he helped me up over that trench line. So I got out three months earlier because I had then accepted at graduate school at Ohio State University. I fell in love uh, with a guy who was going to be teaching uh, at Rutgers University that fall. And Pat and I met in August and moved to New York City. And I finished my coursework at Ohio State. And that was the end of my academic life. And I um, became an actor. I was interviewed for two major television shows, a series from the West Coast. And there's about 12 big men sitting out there in business suits uh, talking to you. And, and then one of them would finally say, well, uh, what's your wife going to say about changing to moving to the West Coast? What about your kids in school? And you say, um, I'm not married. And you would see the blind come down and you knew it was over, you were not going any further. To my knowledge, there was no one on a national level out when I was in the 1950s, 1960s, when I was beginning and working. I, I was very fortunate, I worked very quickly in theater. I was part of the gay veterans in New York, had been for years, and our leader, uh, Boyd, Boyd Matson, a Vietnam veteran, had gotten permission to place a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and we went early morning, nine o'clock, and simply put the wreath and unfurled our gay banner. And some of the tourists there turned their back on us. And I wrote, I wrote an article about this, which was published in the New York Native, called Stepping Off the Curb to Join the Movement. And I ended up by saying, placing a wreath at the Tomb of the Unzone Soldier and looking across the Potomac at reassuring myself once again that I was a part of all this in spite of people who tried to tell me I was not an equal in my own country. Because maybe, maybe the unknown soldier was gay. I'm sitting here on the phone rings and uh, it was NBC and they said, we know of your history and, and uh, two days from now as President Obama is signing the overturn of Don't Ask, Don't Tell and we'd like to hook you up and and you'll be on NBC with, as a guest of Chris Hayes. Mr. Phillips, I'd like to start with you. Um, having gone through the experience in Korea of serving in the U.S. Armed Forces and, and not being able to be honest about who you were with the, the men you served with, what was going through your mind today as you watched the bill signing? Uh, at first, almost disbelief. And of course, great joy. and. Uh, as though somebody had just taken a big load off of my shoulders <laughs> and, uh, to, finally, to finally be able to be open about serving my country, to, to stop lying, which is against that. every principle we're taught as children by our parents, by churches, by schools, yet gays and lesbians do this all the time and it ain't easy and this was, it was just, it, it was wonderful. And Chris Hayes was very nice. He said, I, Garrison, I'm going to give you the last word. You've watched uh, the, the politics of this over a long period of time, and I wonder if you ever really thought that you would see the day that we're seeing today. I didn't think it would happen in my lifetime, no. Really? But it has. But I just say, like, like the commander, I have great faith in the training that our armed forces gives us. And I think we'll have some difficulties, some things to overcome. But it will be, it'll make us stronger, just like the integration that President Truman did of black forces into the armed services. It will be a positive, a positive thing that happens. I was so grateful that I had the chance to uh, be a part of that, kind of put a period on things after this many years. <laughs>
uh, of marches and protests and losing upwards of 80 some friends. I have a list of to AIDS. Um, in the early days, it was, it was very difficult. Uh, I was a volunteer then, and we took the information on AIDS around. I made a list of those hospitals and doctor's offices that refused to take the literature. This was 1982. That was the kind of opposition we were fighting. And to see this now, national television, being able to serve openly, to say I'm gay, uh, very proud moment. <laughs>